All right, are we ready to go? Yeah. Yep. Whatever, whatever you want to do. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome to Head Talks. Thanks. You're welcome. Welcome to our the last in our series. This is the final. This is um, the very last one of our traditional holidays and the reason why we do crazy things on our holidays. And today we're talking about, well, I guess it's pretty obvious. Yes. All right, so today we are talking about Christmas. And I hope, I hope I have some surprises for you today. But before we get to that, I'm gonna do a really, really fast, <laughs> like a speed through. Guess how many slides I have today? 83. I have 118. Oh, yes. Okay, so uh, yeah, I have 118 slides. So we're gonna go through this like super fast, so we can get to uh, so we can get to Christmas. All right, so let's do our um, our super fast drive through version of um, review. Okay, so last week we did. Yes, yeah. Thanksgiving. We did Thanksgiving. Oh, Thanksgiving. And really what we were looking at was that this is what we think of when we think of Thanksgiving, correct? Yeah. That it looks just like this. That there were pilgrims and there were natives, the Wampanoag, and there was turkey and stuffing and all of that. But it didn't quite go down that way despite what our second grade teacher told us. <laughs> right? It wasn't quite like that. Um, was it? And it's too warm looking. You're right about that. Yes. Yes. It would have been uh, colder, I'm sure. All right. So we took a look at the things, the added things that um, our, our elementary school teacher did not tell us about. And one of them was that there were supposed to be two ships, correct? Yeah. yeah, so we had the Mayflower, but did you also, did you know that there was also supposed to be the Speedwell? And what happened to the Speedwell? Do you remember? It wasn't Speedwell. It wasn't Speedwell. Excellent, excellent. Dennis, you didn't sleep through the whole thing, I see. <laughs> that was the only thing you remember? <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stop teasing you now. <laughs> I think I'm done. And it wasn't seaworthy, therefore, they turned back. Whoops, they had to abandon that, and then everybody wound up in the Mayflower. So what was supposed to hold two uh, boatloads of people, we had to squeeze them all into one, so I'm sure that was very unpleasant. Wouldn't you think so? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah, 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 very, very unpleasant. And then when they arrived here, of course, you know, the version that we heard was that the friendly natives helped out. They did not. And everything was um, just very, you know, copacetic and, and sweet and wonderful. Uh, but that's not exactly how it went. When the pilgrims arrived, did they respect the fact that the Wampanoag occupied this much territory. No. no, they did not respect that. In fact, they thought that because they didn't plant in the way that the English did, that it wasn't their land. They thought this land was what? Free. Yeah, up for grabs. It didn't belong to anybody, and so they took over. And um, they they aggravated the situation to the extent that, um, if you remember from last week, the pilgrims had actually disturbed burial sites mm -hmm. of the Wampanoag. And so between the two peoples, there was a great deal of tension. tension. Yeah, a lot of tension. Um, and it could have gone really, really, really badly for the pilgrims. Because remember, how many were there after the first winter? 50. Yes, 50. About 50 were left after the first winter. Um, so many of their, so many of their group had passed away, and then a miracle happened. And that miracle was a native approached the settlement. Remember this yeah. from last week, and they were shocked because what? What did he do? He spoke. Excellent. Oh my God. He spoke like an Englishman. He spoke um, 
very, very well. Okay, and you remember this is Tisquantum, and he's from the Patuxet tribe, and his story was actually fascinating, wasn't it? Yeah. Yes, so when he was a young man, he was kidnapped by the Spanish, taken to Spain, sold as a slave. He escaped, made his way to England. Can you imagine this? Yeah. My gosh, made his way to England. And when he arrived in England, he met somebody there. Pocahontas. Pocahontas, yes, exactly, Pocahontas. And so from there, he was able to get help to go back to his homeland. But when he got back to his homeland, all of his people had died. And what did they die from? They were wiped out. Yes, exactly. Yes, they were wiped out um, by disease brought, brought here by the Europeans. All right, and the Europeans called this man. Squanto. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So we know him better as uh, Squanto. Now, despite all of that, when the Wampanoag, he became a member of the Wampanoag tribe, when the Wampanoag approached the settlement to try to deal with these people that were on their land. Guanto goes with them, and they're surprised to find out that he speaks English. So he becomes the liaison, but he also is helping them, remember? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so he's teaching them uh, the best uh, vegetables to plant, the best places to fish. To fish. Exact yes, that's exactly right. So he's teaching them how to work the land and the natural resources of where they were. He lived with them for about nine months after that first winter. And at the end of that, did they have a good harvest? Yeah. Yes. yes. They did. They had a good harvest, and they were able um, to rest assured that they would make it through this winter, that this was going to be um, a winter that, that they would have enough food and that they were going to make it. And so they had their feast to celebrate after the harvest, and um, did they invite the Wampanoag? No. no. They, weren't, they were not invited. <laughs> they didn't invite them. It was just something they were doing amongst themselves. And remember, there's like about 50 of them at this time, but while they were celebrating part of the festivities, was not only to shoot off their guns, but also to, to shoot off their cannons. They had cannons. So, of course, these loud, frightening noises caused the Wampanoag to what? Come and check out. They want to come see what, what is this? What's, what's happening what's here? Noise? Yeah, what is all this noise? What's going on? And so they, uh, they put together a party of 90 people. Okay, there's 90 warriors that come along and they see that it's really a feast and they're having, they're having a celebration. And so now the pilgrims have 90 unexpected guests for dinner. All right, so they weren't originally invited. They were just, um, they just appeared because they wanted to know what the heck was going on. And did, did we need to be worried about this? So we also know, too, that not to worry about the amount of food that was available because the Wampanoag did what? They brought their own. They went out hunting and they brought their own. So they did stay um, and they did have this fellowship with the pilgrims. Um, they brought their own food because, you know, they realized that, you know, 90 extra people when you're only expecting 50 could be a problem. And the reason why we know that they brought in five deer, we know what they brought, they brought five deer. And the reason we know that is because, does anybody remember? Edward Winslow. Excellent, Bob. Edward Winslow was, yes, he was in attendance at this festival. He was there, he was one of them. And he wrote a letter back home to a friend 
and he happened to have in this letter described the events. I guess it, it lasted, according to Winslow, it lasted about three days. He wrote about what happened so we can have a much better idea of what that was actually like. But in this letter, it reveals other things to us, okay? Other, perhaps, misinformation. Um, we don't know that they had turkey because the letter says that they, the men went out and shot fowl. So it could have been quail, pheasant, duck, duck. Yeah, it, yeah. It could have, it could have been turkey. It certainly could have been. But it's it, goose. It seems much more likely that what they would have had more predominantly than fowl would have been. Fish. 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 And the fish would have also included, if you consider where they where they are. Lobster. Excellent. Yes, yes. So lobster may have been part of the um, this Thanksgiving feast. Okay? And then we do know that squash, pumpkin, those things were successful. They had successful harvests with those items. We also know that they did not have sugar. The pilgrims didn't bring sugar with them. And so unfortunately, they didn't have any apple pie. Oh, no, pie. no apple pie. Yeah, no apple pie. And because we have Winslow's letter, um, we, we can also be very secure in the thought that this just happened one time, okay? It didn't happen every year. They didn't get together another time after that. All right, and we were pretty surprised to find out the year that Thanksgiving actually became a national federal holiday. Does anybody remember the date? Excellent. Oh my gosh, Dennis, you should sleep through more of them. You're remembering everything. It seems like it just seeped into your brain. I know, yes. Didn't Edgar Casey learn that way? Right, he slept on it. Yes, it's possible, it's possible. Yes, so it didn't become a legal national holiday until 1941. And we were kind of proud of the fact that it became a national holiday, a legal holiday, because of someone that lives, that comes from New Hampshire. Do you remember her? No. no. Mary had a little lamb. Yes, the author of Mary Had a Little Lamb. Sarah Hale. Yes, yes. And we also know her, not just from um, having penned Mary Had a Little Lamb, but she was also the editor, do you remember? Boys Boys Boys. Boys. Yes, she was the editor of the most popular women's magazine of that day. So we've got, you know, we've got um, bragging rights about Sarah Hale from who hails from New Hampshire. I couldn't resist that. I had to say that. And um, what she has to do with Thanksgiving is, in the years leading up to the Civil War and during the Civil War, um, she wanted something to bring the country together. And her thought was a Thanksgiving holiday that we all celebrate as a country, as the united States. And so she really lobbied very hard for this. She wanted it to be the fourth Thursday of the month of November because the reason she chose that, does anyone remember Dennis? Do you remember this? Uh. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm kidding. It was like a, it was like a little uh, thing that I had mentioned. George Washington had established, like just for one time, it was a one-time thing, but it was the fourth Thursday in November, and it was a day of gratitude. So Sarah Hale took that idea and said, let's make this a day of Thanksgiving that we celebrate every year. And no matter who she wrote to, governors, president, didn't matter who she wrote to, uh, people just weren't interested, weren't interested, until she came across one president who was. Abraham Lincoln. Yes, Abraham Lincoln. And he wasn't ready to make it a legal 
federal holiday, but he, he would make it uh, a yearly thing. All right, so he would issue a proclamation every year that we would have a day of Thanksgiving and a feast on the fourth Thursday of the month. And it had to be reissued every single year. So future presidents weren't bound by anything. They could do it if they wanted to or, or not. And the reason why he hesitated, I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but the reason why he hesitated with that was because the southern states were resisting. They thought it was a New England thing and that those New Englanders, those northerners, were imposing their traditions onto us. So they, so the southern states were, were resisting this, and that's why Lincoln didn't go um, all in uh, for her, because he did, he thought it was a really good idea, and he really did like, like that idea. So every single year, the new president had to issue that there would be a Thanksgiving feast on the fourth Thursday, and it was happening. All the presidents were doing that, um, but there was one president that came up with a stellar idea. He thought, you know what, we'll do it, but we'll just bump it up one week. All right, so we'll have it here instead. We'll do it on the third Thursday instead of the fourth. And do you remember the reason why? No. No. An extra week for Christmas shopping. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we want an extra week for Christmas shopping. All right, that's going to help out the retailers. Um, but the people in the country were so perplexed by this. They were confused. They didn't know why he would be doing this or what day should we do it on. So there were people that did it the third, there were people that did it the fourth, there were people that did it on both days just to be safe because they didn't know what was what. And the president that did this, Bill, you got this last week. Yes, excellent, Roosevelt. Yes, Roosevelt. And because it was, it was such a, it, confusing and everybody was all upset and uh, in an uproar over it. Um, they wound up calling it He was. That's exactly what he was doing. Yeah. Did everyone hear what Judy said? He was trying to help in the depression. He was trying to help the retailers. Uh, but yeah, it just like threw people. It just, just spun them around. They, I don't I, I don't know why, I, I just, I'm not sure why, but anyway, so then it became known as Frank's Giving. And because it was threw people into such turmoil that Congress had to step in. Congress had to step in and clean up this mess. <laughs> All right, so in 1941, Congress passed a law that we would have a Thanksgiving on the 4th, not the 3rd, on the 4th Thursday of November, and that this would be something that happened automatically every year. And so that's why we now just know that we're going to have Thanksgiving on the 4th Thursday of November, okay? All right, we wanted to get the record straight on a couple of things. We'll go through them super quickly. Okay, everybody always hears that the day before Thanksgiving is the busiest travel day of the year. Well, so far, it, wa it was pretty busy this year. It was like unusually busy this year. But typically, the day before Thanksgiving doesn't even make the top 25. All right, it's usually in the summer months, and it's usually on a weekend or right before a weekend. We also hear that the tryptophan in Turkey makes us sleepy. 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 Um, but it really doesn't. That's not what's going on here. Because tryptophan in Turkey comes in, it's in there, but it's in, uh, it's in low levels. And look at the other foods here that have much, much higher levels. All right, so it's probably that you ate too much. Yeah. You just ate too much overeating. 
is what's causing that. Also, so Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade um, in 1924, and we're all familiar with Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. It's very famous, right? But we um, noted last week that it didn't start with Macy's. It started in Philadelphia with their primary. Gimbal. Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. So with their, with their primary competitor, Gimbal's, started um, four years before that, and uh, Macy's copied them. All right, and then we had a couple of notes of interest. The balloons, remember the big balloons and uh, years ago when it first started at the end of the parade, what did they do with those balloons? Balloons are like a Yeah. <laughs> now what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yes, yes, so there were some very close, uh, some near misses with aircraft. Now we had some air traffic. Um, up there, so they had to store the balloons. Do you remember? Yeah, New Jersey. In New Jersey, yes, in an abandoned Tootsie Roll factory mm -hmm. in New Jersey. All right, and then I also wanted to um, just give you an opportunity to guess at the year the very first Thanksgiving Day um, football game was played. People came really close. There were some. 1874. Awesome, Dennis. Oh my goodness, Dennis, I am shocked. You did a great job. I don't think you were sleeping last week. I think you were faking. Yeah, I think you were faking. All right, so that was Thanksgiving. Are we ready to move on? We're done with Thanksgiving, and now we can move along to... Yes, let's move along to Christmas. Let's find out how did it all start. Well. Please bear with me. So many of you have been with me for a long time, and you know I like to start at the super, super, super beginning, and I guess I did that again today. So I'm starting out with the book of Ruth. <laughs> I know, it's a surprise, but I have a reason for doing this, all right? And the reason is, how do we get to Bethlehem? Do you know? It's through Ruth. It's through Ruth. It's through the book of Ruth. You know, Ruth was not Jewish. She married a Jewish man who died, and um, she would not leave her mother-in-law. Do you remember that yeah. right. part of the story? Nope, she was going to take care of her. She was going to stay with her. She wasn't going to leave her. And so um, her mother-in-law had to go back to her homeland, and her homeland was Bethlehem. And while Ruth was there with her mother, Naomi, um, she married a Jewish man there, okay? And who is the descendant of Ruth? David. Yes, okay? So Ruth gets married to a Jewish man, and then this is how the line goes. And from there, we have we have two lines of heritage, one from Matthew and one from Luke. So in the nativity story in the New Testament, it's, it's Matthew and Luke that find it very important to trace the lineage. They go, look at the trouble they go to. All right, so they're going to go back and back and back and back. We go um, from Abraham, and we're going to go all the way down to David. This is the husband of Ruth right here. All right, and these are the descendants, and then we get to who? Yes, and then Luke does it uh, with, with more <laughs> detail. Look at Luke, okay? So that's how we get into, we get into Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is a big part of the Christmas story, right? Yes. Yeah. It's a huge part of the Christmas story. Okay, and w one big part of it is that Rome, at the time the Bible tells us, issues a decree, and what is that decree? Everybody go to their home for the census. Yes, everybody has to, there's a census, and everybody has to go 
um, to be counted. So Mary and Joseph go, even though she is um, ready to deliver, but they have to go uh, because it's a Roman decree. And so this is where Jesus was born, and we know the story, correct? There was no room at the inn. All right, so there was, Jesus was born in a manger. If you look here, we've got all the elements of the story. What's this? And, and who's this? Yes. Yes, and then who, who are these guys? Shepherds. And who told them to be here? And yes, all right, so everything's there, correct? It's all there. Do you know that that's not what it says in the Bible? No. <laughs> Do you know that this is the amalgamation of two separate stories? So we've already said uh, Matthew and Luke are the only two of the Gospels that tell the story, okay? But there are stark differences. All right, here in Matthew, okay? Matthew says that the hometown is where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, but what does Luke say? Yes. All right, so we, we're, we are, you're gonna see how we're just pulling everything into one story. There's two stories, but we're gonna take it all and we're gonna put it all in one basket here, okay? All right, so let's see. Let's see, um, why Bethlehem? David's hometown, because of the census. Here's the story of the census. Birthplace in Matthew, it's a house. In Luke, it's a stable, okay? And who was the ruler? Remember the ruler at the time? Herod the Great. Yes, but here, so in Herod the Great, is um, he's the king of Judea. All right, but here, it's the Roman emperor, okay? In Matthew, we have the star that's leading who? The wise guy. And then in Luke, we have an angel, and who is the angel guiding? Shepherds. 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 Okay? All right, so you, can, you see these, these differences, and we just took the two different stories put them together and now we have all this this um, imagery and iconography about the two nativity stories pulled together in one and it's all familiar to us isn't it all of it is familiar to us but did you know that the followers of Jesus did not celebrate or acknowledge the nativity the birth of Jesus they didn't do that in fact that was not observed can anybody guess how long how long not until the fourth century and not until the fourth century um, CE all right when Constantine yes when Constantine the Great accepted Christianity and made it the empire's religion, made it a, um, a recognized religion, all right? So it's the fourth century BC that even any question about the birth of Jesus comes up and it is decided at this point in time in the fourth century, I think it was 351, that it was decided that the date given for the birth of Jesus was going to be, we all know this date, right? Okay, December 25th. Oh, December 25th. Why would that be? What was the celebration? Why would we want to choose December 25th? It's the solstice. It's the solstice. Yeah. And, and we can we can be pretty positive that it wasn't in December because where were the shepherds? In the, fields. In the, fields. the shepherds were out in the fields, so would it been would it have been winter months? Yeah. 
No. 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 All right, so people are trying to figure out when was it? When was it? Well, there's all kinds of ideas. There's all kinds of things um, tossed out there. Maybe it was March, maybe it was September, maybe it was May, maybe it was, and everybody has a theory. The only thing anyone agrees on is that it wasn't in December. It was not in December. So we can all agree that no, it probably would not have been in December. So what was in December? Everybody is was shouting it out. You were all just saying it. The winter solstice. The winter solstice, exactly. And if we're, who is it that's accepting Christianity first? Pagans. The Romans, right? The Romans. So we're in Rome, and when in Rome, Okay, and what were they celebrating at that time of the year? Well, they were celebrating something called Saturnalia. Exactly. Saturnalia. What is Saturnalia? Well, it happens in December. It usually lands on December 17th. Okay, and this is a celebration in honor of the god Saturn. Hence the name Saturnalia. Okay, and he is um, he is the, the god of time and some other things too, but it's time because is the winter solstice is the winter solstice a scary time for people? Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's a very scary time. Yes. It's a really scary time. The days are shorter, the nights are longer, you can't grow crops, everything is um, everything is, is underground and won't come back to life for months. It's a scary time. It's a very scary time. And so we've got Saturnalia that starts in um, on December 17th, right around there. And so that's going to last for several days. And it's going into the winter solstice. And you've got a lot of food, don't you? Because what did you just do? Yes. And you know, if you've got animals that you cannot feed through the winter, you save some for breeding, right? But what do you do with the others? Harvesting. Yes, exactly. So it's a time when you have more food than you're ever going to have, correct? You're, gonna, you're never going to have in the year more food than you do right now. And so it's a time of absolute revelry. They are drinking and eating and they're uh, doing crazy, bizarre things like the, uh, the servants can tell the master what to do. They have like, a, like an upside down, um, backwards days where where the slaves are free and they boss around their masters and it's just a, it, it, there's just revelry. The other thing that happens during Saturnalia is that there is gift giving. They give gifts during Saturnalia and they also do something else. They have a portion of the time that is devoted to the children and that's called juvenilia. Juvenalia, all right, where you're paying attention to the children and you're indulging the, ju the children. Now, Saturnalia is immediately followed up by the winter solstice, and then immediately after that, what is it? New Year. New Year. So how long does this festival really last? It lasts for a long time, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, what are they celebrating during the winter solstice who would be associated with December 25th? Well, in Rome, there is a god. There's a god that they... Um, are worshiping, and he is the god of the sun. He is the Sol Invictus. Okay? So he is the sun god, and if you're in winter, 
and you're in the shortest days, what are you longing for? The sun. The sun, the sun. The sun to what? Yeah. To return. Yeah, for the sun to return. Okay? So this is a special time of feasting and um, sacrificing to Saul Invictus. Another god, this is a like a smaller kind of cult that you may have heard of who's also associated with um, having been uh, given born on December 25th, and that is Mithras. Have you ever heard of Mithras? No, not really. Mithras was a uh, popular uh, cult god in Rome at the time whose birth was, was said to have been on December 25th, and when he was born, guess who visited him? Shepherds. Oh, shepherds. Yeah, shepherds came to uh, to visit him. So now, as they're having all of these feast days, kind of um, consecutively, one after the other, what it would have looked like in Rome for about a month, a month long, would have been a festival more similar to, excellent, I was hoping someone would shout that out, yes. So think of, so think of in your mind what you want to be picturing, this first thought of Christmas is more like, would have looked more like Mardi Gras, all right? It's a Mardi Gras type of a festival, type of um, celebration. All right, but now we've got Constantine who's brought in Christianity, correct? Yeah. So we want to take these two things that are happening simultaneously, and what they're going to do with them is somehow, somehow we have to marry these two ideations. Okay, we have to marry these two things together. All right, so we're going to see how that's happening. Now we've already we've already seen that there is gift giving, right? Yeah. We've already seen that there's an acknowledgement of children with juvenilia, correct? Yeah. So those are elements that sound familiar to us, and we also know that the missionaries go from Rome and they start going to the north, don't they? They start going to the northern countries to spread um, the good news and uh, to convert the pagans out there, correct? Now, if winter is scary in Rome, how much scarier is it in Scandinavia? In Scandinavia, thank you, yes. How much more terrifying would it be in Scandinavia? It's dark. It's dark. It's dark, it's colder, it's colder. It's, it's just that much more uh, terrifying. Is it po more likely that you would lose your life during winter months in Scandinavia? Yes, it's yeah. more likely that you would. And so this is a time, and it's gonna last longer too, this is a time where people are absolutely terrified, right? They're inside, they're inside for a long time, and so what they're doing to give them hope, the hope that they have during those long winter months is to bring the greens in. All right, have you heard of Yule time? Yeah. Yes. And we still use Yule today when we're, when we're talking about Christmas, right? It's Yule time. Well, Yule Tide from the Norse people is a time when they would bring the greens in because what does that remind them of? The summer sun. That spring is coming, or that even more poignantly, that something can remain alive during the what? The winter. The winter. Yes. So they bring, they bring greens in. We have the Yule log, all right? This is a huge log, a tree trunk, 
and the men will drag it inside and they light it and this log lasts for about 12 days. So there's feasting. Again, this is the time of the harvest, so they have a lot of food right now. All right? So the people are getting together. And yes, Dennis, the 12 days of Christmas. All right? So we're seeing that again. We're seeing that a second time here. Okay? So 12 days of Christmas is um, Yule time. And here is the Yule law. Now, we have a version of the Yule log that I like a lot better. <laughs> oh, yes. Right? Yes. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. I love these. I get one every year. Yes. So I like our Yule log um, better, but if I were frightened and cold, I would want theirs. So, but, I, but I live now, thankfully. Thank you, thank you that I'm here right now. All right, and then um, the greens that they're bringing in are, are things that we're familiar with, right? Yes. Do we still do this? Yes. 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 What about um, Christmas trees? Christmas trees are evergreens, correct? Right. Yes, yeah, so that, so these, yeah, so they brought them in to give them hope, to remind them that this was a symbol of something that is living through the winter, okay? It's staying alive through the winter. And if this can, so can we. I also want to point out in the Norse, before we leave Norse, do you know that the god Odin, all right, so let's look at this closely. Odin, all right, during the winter months, he flies through the night on an eight-legged horse, Eight. Sounds strange. He decides who should prosper and who should perish. What would be a kid-friendly version of that? Santa Claus. Eight reindeer. Bob got the eight reindeer. And what about naughty and nice? Yeah, okay, you see, all right, so, you, so you're seeing the imagery um, being brought in, but, but brought in in a little bit nicer way. Here, Odin, Odin was terrifying. He was going to decide if he lived or died. Um, so Santa's better than that. You just get cold if you, don't, uh, if you don't behave. All right, so now the Druids. So now let's look at the Druids. We have Holly because the Druid belief is that holly is a revered plant. It has potent healing properties. And that um, if you have holly with you, that you will be blessed. It's a blessing. It's a blessing. So we still have that today, don't we? Yes. All right, so now we have the missionaries coming to the north, correct? Yeah. And just like how we saw this in Easter and we saw this in Halloween, what are the missionaries trying to do? Convert. Convert. But they're trying but they're trying to do that and they're trying to convert people um, by relating. Let's relate. Let's find some common ground. I want to reach out to you in a way that you will understand so we can understand one another. All right, so the missionaries come and they're seeing the evergreens brought into the houses and they're thinking to themselves, all right, what can we do with this? How can I relate to them? Oh, I know, I know. What we'll do with these evergreens in the house is we'll put apples on them and talk about Adam and Eve. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to hang apples on the evergreens. We're going to talk about Adam and Eve and what happened there. And now, it's not a big leap to see how we could go from this to this. Oh, God. Right? <laughs> yes. So we have ornaments. Did you ever wonder where ornaments came from? It was missionaries hanging apples on the evergreens to try to relate trying to relate. Now, it's still 
it's still this this Mardi Gras. Definitely. Yeah. Hanging apples on the tree and talking about Adam and Eve did not did, yeah, didn't yeah, did not lower the temperature here. It was still a Mardi Gras kind of a thing. In fact, it could get completely out of control. And in England it did. So Christmas, now it's called Christmas, and Christmas was actually um, like a scary time because uh, they were doing more Halloween type things like trick or treat. <laughs> so at Christmas, you could pound on somebody's door and demand that they give you the best of their food. So, they're, so the, the um, wealthy people are having a nice dinner and poor people are pounding on the door saying, give us something. And what would happen if you didn't, if you told them to get out of here? They would wreck the place. Yeah, so it was actually very dangerous. It was so dangerous, in fact, that Oliver Cromwell, in 1644, banned Christmas. Yes, Christmas was banned, and it was banned for years. Here it is. All right. Yeah. So now Oliver Cromwell, if you remember the story, do you remember um, he was like the, the Lord Protector? He's the Prime Minister. Yeah. 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 And they cut the head off of Charles the First. Yeah, they yeah. did. Remember that? Yeah. And so they didn't have a monarch anymore, and Oliver Cromwell ran the country. Yeah. That's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's amazing, but it didn't last for very long, did it? Years. They reverted back to the monarch. Remember, remember Charles II comes yeah. along. Yeah. They bring back the the monarchy. Do you know why? They wanted Christmas reinstated. They wanted Christmas celebration to come back. I'm sure that wasn't the whole reason, but that was a big part of it. He comes back. He's, they reinstate the monarchy, and the first thing he does is, let's have Christmas. Yeah, let's have fun. Let's do Christmas again. So, every, so Christmas comes back. But that's in England. What's happening in New England? Oh, did you know? Did you know that the Puritans also, did you know that in Massachusetts, Christmas was against the law. Yeah. Christmas was against the law. In fact, <coughs> anyone displaying any Christmas spirit was fined five shillings. That was a lot of money back then. All right. That is an actual shilling of the time, just so you know. I, I found one. All right, so that goes on. That Christmas is not anything anybody wants to deal with here in New England for, for like 200 years. Did you know that? No, I didn't know that. For like 200 years. The tide begins to turn. It's very late. You'd be surprised at how recent all of our Christmas traditions are. The tide begins to turn during the Industrial Revolution, and it's during the Industrial Revolution that we really have a very striking class distinction, correct? Yes. 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 All right, so we have the robber barons, and they are like filthy rich, aren't they? Yes. I mean, ridiculously rich. Right? On the backs of the poor. Yeah. What? That's what they did. On the backs of the poor. On the backs of the poor. That's, that's exactly, yeah, push. that's exactly right. So we've got the contrast here. So we have the robber barons um, the on the backs of the poor. And that's how they're living, and that's how they are living. And they're all in the same area, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're all kind of in the same area living together. So they're encountering them. They're seeing it. And it really brought it home. And what really came up out of this for many people was that, you know, you know what we forgot? We claim to be Christians, but you know what we forgot? 
Christian than Christianity. Now he's having what God, what uh, Jesus Christ is preach. Helping the poor. The poor. Helping the poor. Helping the poor. And so now, even the robber barons are feeling like, all right, if we want to change the narrative here, if we want to redefine this Christmas celebration that that really kind of shows up because now people are going to be pounding down your door to get something because you're filthy rich and they're they're devastatingly poor, right? And so you're probably going to have your property destroyed. Well, if you want to tame it, then maybe we should go back to Christian values. And this is exactly what's happening in during the Industrial Revolution. And it's highlighted beautifully, beautifully, beautifully by Oh, oh Christmas Carol Charles, Charles Dickens. Yes. So the so the robber barons are are illustrated in the personality of who? Scrooge. Scrooge. Yeah, exactly. Scrooge. And so this beautiful piece of literature uh, really spoke to the people of the time, didn't it? Yes, it did. And it changed, um, it changed a lot of minds and hearts. And so this is where it's going to start to change. We're going to take a turn here. We're going to start thinking about a time of giving, a time of charity. Is Christmas a time of charity today? Yes. 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 It has kept, we have kept that. The other thing that was happening in this Victorian era was a shift towards the children, okay, towards the children, and to making it, bringing it from an outside Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras revelry kind of thing. It was a family. Inside, to the family, Effie, exactly, you're right. And also, this um, Christmas tree, so this is Prince Albert, and he brings this tradition to England because it was a northern thing. Yeah, yes, from Germany. Germany. So he brings that, and then uh, people in England loved it, and they started doing it, and people in America loved it also and started doing it. So now all of a sudden, and this is like the, the uh, we're talking about the 19th century, wow. mm. right? Yeah. It's not that long ago. Uh, relatively, and now we're going to have it be geared towards who? Yes. Geared towards the children. We're going to rebring in from Saturnalia, uh, Juvenalia, and we're going to be giving uh, gifts to the children. The very first Christmas card happened immediately after the Christmas tree um, happened. Okay, this is the um, J.C. Horsley Company, and this was in England. It was controversial. Do you see this kid drinking wine? <laughs> so they were criticized. You're, you're depicting a child drinking wine. That's probably not a good idea. So they were criticized, but it doesn't matter. Christmas was, yeah, Christmas cards were a huge hit, and we borrowed that here. We got right on board with that. All right. Did you know that? Uh, wait, oh my yes, exactly. Where does the point center come from? The U.S. ambassador to Spain. Yeah, point set. He was getting into this kind of redefining Christmas. Let's redefine it. And when he was in Spain, he thought, "Oh, I have the perfect plant that would go with this." And so he brings back the point center. All right, I gotta go fast now. All right, so somebody who really, really helped define and change Christmas is Clement Clark Moore. And he was able to redefine Christmas and give us a strong guidance because he himself was very, very impressed by two ancient personalities. All right, one of them was the Greek Saint Nicholas, right? Greek Saint Nicholas, and uh, so he wrote the night before. Christmas. The night before Christmas. Yes, it was originally called A Visit from Saint Nicholas, mm -hmm. and then it now it's known as the night before Christmas. And what did that give us? 
Santa Claus. Yeah, an idea of Santa Claus. And he's also, he was also um, influenced by uh, Sinterklaas, who is the patron saint of children. But we don't just get Santa Claus, but in the night before Christmas, because the night before Christmas, we also get who? Oh, the reindeer. This yeah, we get the reindeer. We know their names and everything, right? Yes, and how many of them are there? Eight. Yes, oh my gosh. Yes, exactly, yes. All right, so that so we get that. Now, once we get this St. Nicholas, we really don't know exactly what he looks like, okay? So we've got the early 19th century people are trying to figure out what does he look like? What does he look like? And here's some early versions. Oh yeah. Okay, so these are some early versions and you can kind of see, you know, we've got it's starting to it's starting to look like the Santa that we know. All right, but he's kind of got variations there that we that we don't typically see. And it wasn't until a cartoonist from New York Tom, uh, Thomas Nast is his name, and he's decided that he is going to create the look. All right, and so he does this. This is his version of it. So we're getting we're getting a little bit closer to the Santa Claus that we know of today. Do you know who put the final touches on Santa on our Santa? Who polished Santa all up for us? The one that we created present to our children? Norman Rockwell. Not Norman Rockwell, nope. That's a great, great guess. But it was not Norman Rockwell that gave us this. Coca-Cola. Exactly. Coca -Cola. It was Coca-Cola that gave us the Santa that we know today. That's funny. It is, it's hysterical. Yes. All right, so there was, you know, we had people that were right on right on target with the whole merchandising thing, right? And so they weren't going to miss out on that. So yeah, so this is uh, one of the earliest Coca-Cola ads featuring the Santa Claus. And that is the Santa Claus that we know of today. And we have uh, Coca-Cola to thank for that. And then Coca-Cola wasn't the only merchant to influence our Christmas icons. There's also this guy, Robert May. He is the author of Rudolph. Rudolph. Yeah, he is the author of Rudolph. So Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So you might think to yourself, oh, isn't that sweet? Perhaps he wrote that for his children or something. Yeah, no, that's not why he wrote it. It was a promotional for Montgomery Ward. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was a promotional uh, giveaway at Montgomery Ward. So there's all kinds of other little things that we could talk about, but we hit the really um, predominant things that we celebrate with so that we can make for our children a magical, wonderful, time for our, for our sweet, innocent little kids. <laughs> He's up to no good. Yeah, look at him. Uh, no, yeah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I mean, I don't know what your kids look like. Mine look just like this. <laughs> So, yeah, we have this wonderful, wonderful holiday. This is the kind of crazy way that it all uh, came to, to be, to be. Why, we do, why we do the, the things that we do. It is a secular holiday mm -hmm. that's been combined with a religious holiday, and you clearly see the secular part of it, and you clearly see um, the religious part of it. So what did you think of this whole series? Excellent. 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 Excellent.